Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. We're going to be talking about some of the favorite flowering plants of Dr. Elizabeth Wally, uh, but before we get to Elizabeth, we have to introduce our co-host with us every single week. We are joined by local foods educator Katie Parker and Quincy. Hey, Katie. Hey, Chris. How's it going? I am doing just great. Uh, can't no complaints. I'll say. Good uh, deal. How about yourself? Yeah, I can't complain either. Yeah. Well, you look like you're dressed for fall. You so you look like you're ready for uh, some pumpkin spice lattes. <laughs> I don't drink coffee, so uh, I won't be <laughs> drinking any pumpkin spice lattes. But bring on the the pumpkin flavored desserts. But yeah, it's really cooled off. How about in the home? It is getting chillier by the minute, but it's not too bad right now. This is. Uh, I call it our the paradise time of year for us here in Illinois. So it is delightful outside, at least to me. And Katie, I am so glad that you coordinated with our other co-host, Ken, to match his beard color with your shirt there. Uh, Ken Johnson, horticulture educator in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello. It's, it's difficult to match the color sometimes. <laughs> I'll have to let you borrow it sometime. <laughs> Everything will just blend in. <laughs> one big orange can there yes so uh so so guys today we are going to be talking uh with elizabeth about her favorite flowering plants but i'm curious before we get to elizabeth uh, do either of you have a favorite plant or is that impossible to even narrow down i think it depends on the time of year what's mm-hmm. blooming whatever is blooming <laughs> is the favorite as long right. as it behaves i'd have to say the same and i think i might have some new plants to try after seeing all of Elizabeth's photos. Yes, I am super excited to dive into our topic today. So let us introduce Dr. Elizabeth Wally, commercial ag educator with U of I Extension. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Well, it's great to be on and particularly talking about plants. Love plants. Exactly, <laughs> yes. And um, you, Elizabeth, you have a, a, a name about yourself around Extension when it comes to, to nurseries. You and our, our colleague uh, who's retired now, Martha Smith, uh, boy, you have some stories to tell. And I mean, you could have used semi-truck trailers after you're done with nurseries. But before we get to that part, um, re- you have done a program recently about your favorite flowering plants. Now, first off, we have to find out where are you and where is your garden? Well, I'm my home place where I garden is located on the eastern bluffs of the Mississippi River. So if you look at the floodplain of the old floodplain of Mississippi River, I'm on the eastern um, bluff, um, right where it angles up in Madison County. Um, I'm designated as zone 6A, so I might be a little bit warmer than uh, up your way, uh, at least. I'm going to say that uh, I've been at this site for 20 years. When I got there, it was pretty much a blank slate, and I have used it for the past 20 years to indulge my um, one-dimensional lifestyle of uh, growing and researching and evaluating and loving plants. And so um, it is not a blank slate now. Um, It is wall-to-wall. All right, so where do you – so Chris kind of alluded to this in your – you and Martha's trips, uh, but where do you find all your plant material um, and kind of what's your <clears throat> process of selecting plants? Well, I <laughs> kind of laugh at that uh, because I already mentioned that I'm pretty much one dimensional about everything in my life revolves around plants. And, and I mean that seriously. Um, I went to school and got my degrees on plants. I work in commercial ag and commercial fruit and vegetable production, but I have an absolute passion um, for perennials, um, woody and herbaceous at home. So when I go on vacation and it is around looking at plants, when I travel with friends, it's about work looking at plants. So pretty much any time I come home, my husband knows that my car is going to be full of plants no matter what I'm doing. Um, so it suffices to say my favorite thing in life is researching plants um, and sourcing ones I think will work in my garden. Um, so what's my process? Back to your question. Um, I'm going to say that it starts by identifying a plant of interest. Um, that could be from a talk I listened to or a garden I visited or a friend or colleague's recommendation. 
um, magazine or book I read or just from browsing nursery websites. So that's one of my favorite things is to get on a nursery website and just go through their inventory and look at what they've got. So I'm going to say once it's on my wish list, and I do have a pretty extensive wish list, um, I start researching the plant. Um, some of the things that are really important that most gardeners, you know, the obvious things are, is it hardy? Um, what growing conditions does it need? Because I know what my, you know, conditions in my gardens are and, and what I can get away with and what I can't. But as I've gotten older, one of the considerations that has been very important to me is how aggressive is it as a grower? Um, as I've gotten older, I want to spend less and less time. What I'm going to say, I'm going to borrow Pete Oldoff's um, comment. It's not weeding, it's editing. And I don't want to spend all of my um, hours uh, of joy in the garden editing out plants. And so if it uh, smacks anything of suckering, naturalizes, or anything that, you know, smacks of is going to take over my, my garden, it's out. Uh, it just, it, it never makes my list. I just don't want to do that. And so um, I spend just as much time, I would say, researching the nursery that I'm going to source it from, too, because um, anybody <coughs> that has um, shopped locally or gone through mail order know that some are better at their craft than others. And so um, that's another thing that uh, I'm pretty particular about who I buy plant material uh, from. And so um, when I source plants, um, I'm gonna say that I heavily use mail order, but I also um, shop all of my local nurseries. And right now is a great time because a lot of nurseries are have all their perennials on sale because they're trying to reduce inventory with winter um, coming up. And as you mentioned, I have a very good friend that I have an annual plant shopping trip and uh, she's now retired and has uh, acquired an RV. And so now we have even more room uh, to fill with plants because we have run out of room um, in the past with my um, cub um, extended cab truck uh, in the past. So I'm looking forward to having an RV. We had just talked about a program topic of uh, house plants, but in an RV. So doing a class uh, about RV house plants. And so we might need to borrow that RV, Elizabeth, just take some pictures. Yeah, I was going to say you could set it up for a program. It'd be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Martha has no idea. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just give her a call and uh, rent it out. Yep, yep. I hear you have an RV. <laughs> <laughs> so as for Ken and I, it can be really difficult to pick out a favorite plant, um, but let's start in early spring. What plants have stood out to you in your garden at critical times of the year when we crave color? Well, I want to say that, you know, Ken said, you know, it really depends on what time, but you've kind of narrowed it down to the spring when you're craving color. And when you asked that question, the first thing that popped in my head was that wonderful feeling you have when you're walking your garden and you see that first bloom. I mean, to me, it doesn't matter how small it is. It's, it's, it's there and you just have this wonderful feeling. And so, um, Four plants come to mind immediately on giving me that thrill every year that it's happened again. Winter is almost over, spring is coming. And so you probably know the first one I'm gonna say is crocus. I mean, that is so simple, everybody knows it, um, but it, it is just a cheerfulness that you can easily plant um, around the garden and, and it just gives you that thrill. One that people might not be as familiar with is a tree, and it's a Cornelian cherry dogwood. It is not one of our native dogwoods, so it is it's from overseas. Um, this is a yellow blooming dogwood, and it's unlike other dogwoods in that the flowers are very minute, but they are in such a large uh, amount on the plant. It's like this just, oh, I'm going to just call it a, a, a beautiful yellow nimbus um out in the garden it, it's just delicate and it's just yellow and it's beautiful another reason that i like that comes later in the year because it produces edible fruit that are like little tart cherries and i i enjoy it the animals enjoy it so it has uh, a lot of a lot of benefit to it um 
one of the other plants that I really like um, is a native, and that is our native bloodroot, um, Sanguinaria. And um, bloodroot, when it blooms in the early spring, is so white, it's almost blinding uh, when the sun shines on it. it. It, again, just gives me that cheerfulness. And Ken, being an entomologist, probably enjoys this plant too because it's spread by ants. And so the seed actually have a little fatty substance, a, a lipid substance that's um, very attractive to ants. And so they collect the seeds, bring it back to their nest. Um, once they eat the seed, they dispose of it. Um, or once they eat the lipid, they dispose of the seed, in fact, planting it. And so um, all you need to do is plant one and you'll start seeing blood root popping around elsewhere uh, to spread the joy. And the last one is, Hellebores. And I'm going to say this is another plant that is made for collecting, very much like, you know, iris, daffodils, tulips, all those things that you can collect endless cultivars on it. Uh, Hellebores have got that way as well. And so these are called Christmas rose, Lenten rose. They have various different names. Um, they are considered a winter bloomer. And at my property, they probably start blooming anywhere from December, January, but they still kind of look ratty because of winter conditions. Um, about mid-March though, they have come into their most stunning um, beauty. And it is one that I rather enjoy every year, uh, cutting flowers and floating them in a bowl so that you can see the grand variety, but there are, are a lot. So those are my four that I would pick um, you know, for bringing that spring, spring is coming feeling. So one issue I've had with some of my early bloomers, um, I saw that you have some of these dock tooth violet, uh, for mine, we planted those in 2019. So, or 2020. So this is the first year we had them and rabbits kept coming in and mowing them down. I think we only got one or two flowers on our plants because of that. Do you have issues with rabbits or other wildlife eating your stuff? I do have wildlife. I'm I'm on a, well, I've turned it into a wooded site. It wasn't necessarily a wooded site, but, you know, Ken, I, um, you know, my opinion is probably not like everybody's opinion on wildlife. Um, I came to the realization that I, I truly enjoy having wildlife on the property, you know, sitting on the porch, sitting inside, looking outside, you know, seeing deer, seeing turkey, seeing rabbits, seeing all that stuff out in the yard. But the reality is, what are they doing in my yard? They're there to eat, um, you know, or rest. And I came to the realization of what is my trade-off for having these animals in the yard. And so um, what I've really moved towards is um, trying to have a bigger buffet uh, in the yard so that they don't focus on one particular thing that maybe, you know, if they eat a dog tooth violet here, Maybe they move on to something later and don't bother the other four or five that are planted elsewhere in the yard. So I, I have a tendency to, uh, I've moved that I don't just plant them in one spot. I, I try to move it around, but it really, it really has come down to my personal choice um, to invite wildlife into my yard. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't some things in my yard that I absolutely do not want them eating. Um, I was watching a deer come on the property and it had two fawn um, and came up to one of my, you know, hydrangeas that were, or one of my hardy hibiscus, sorry, um, that was in full bloom. And I watched them slurp up those blooms like spaghetti, just slurping it up. And I remember running through my mind, huh, that was worth watching. I'm willing to trade all those flowers they just slurped up just to have watched them suck those up. But then they moved on down and they started to nibble on this plant that was rather rare and difficult to source. And I didn't hesitate to step out on the porch and say, move along. You know, I clapped my hands at and said, move along. And I put a wire cloche over the top of it because I, you know, I now know I do not want you eating this no matter what. This is, I'm not willing to trade this plant. And so, you know, I talk big, but there are a few plants in the garden that, you know, I just really don't want anybody eating. And so that's kind of my take on them. So when is the best time to plant these spring bloomers? Is it too late to plant them now? 
Well, I kind of laugh about this because I'm glad that we have winter because I don't think I ever stop planting. Um, about the only thing that stops them from planting is the ground is frozen or it's just really way too hot for humans to be outside uh, doing work. But um, fall happens to be a really um, good time to plant as well. And, you know, I think most of us prefer um, spring uh, as, as the primary time that we plant. But in the fall, um, you know, there are so many um, you're planting bulbs because a lot of the bulbs come at this time, but nurseries are also, as I already mentioned, you know, running, a lot of nurseries are running sales and trying to downsize on stocks. So you can go out and shop and get some really good um, prices. But in terms of, you know, how well a plant does, you know, our soils are still fairly warm right now. And so even as the air is starting to cool down, soils are still uh, sufficiently warm for when you plant plants and get them watered in well, um, that roots can really get established in the fall and carry them through the winter so that you're kind of a step ahead um, in the following spring. And one of the things that um, I usually tell people is, you know, people plant plants as larval plants. And um, if you plant one in the spring, there's a good chance that um, the larvae you're trying to attract are the adults that lay the eggs when those larvae hatch that they're gonna, you know, decimate that plant because it's so, you know, freshly planted. And so one of the avenues that you can do is plant larval plants in the fall as well. And so I am right now planting um, several plants that, you know, I want as larval plants to get them established. So Elizabeth, moving on into the season a little bit, we're progressing and now uh, in your plant list, let's say we're, we're in later springtime, the peonies or peony, however you want to say it, are blooming. I noticed in the pictures that you had in your presentation that your plants, your peony plants are standing straight up, whereas mine love to just flop over and get mowed by the mower uh, as they flop into the grass. So uh, I have mine planted on a western edge of a woodland. It's probably too much shade, but are there newer cultivars with, with better structure? Like, what am I doing wrong here? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer it in two different ways. So what you can't see in the picture that you were looking at is each one of those individual stems has been staked. <gasps> and so, you know, there are just some peonies that are, are not capable of supporting those really heavy blooms. That's just the reality of it. And so I have, you know, one or two cultivars that fall in that category. And so I know um, that when they have grown as tall as they're gonna get and that bud is just on the point of starting to unfold, that's when I go in with individual um, stakes and stake every flower on that. I think that plant probably has 40 blooms on it uh, mm. that you would have been seeing. So, you know, it, it takes quite a few stakes to do individual. And that C is why then the, the big peony rings uh, come out for those that just want to put one ring around the whole entire bush uh, and hold it up. So that's one issue. Um, you know, if you just have one, you can, you can stake them. Um, and you already mentioned that um, most peonies are full sun and for those that, you know, or at least a half a day sun. And for those that get less than that, they're more prone to possibly lodging over like that. And so siding in a more sunny site, um, you know, is a possibility. But what you mentioned is, yes, there are, in fact, that's a characteristic of peonies. And so when you're, you know, looking them over um, and, and reading their description and doing a little research on them, um, how um, erect or, you know, straight they are, or, or, you know, resistant to lodging or flopping uh, is a characteristic. So um, breeders are, are looking at those characteristics and trying to incorporate them. And a lot of the, you know, uh, plants and merits or any of the, you know, different programs that, you know, um, that mark them as garden worthy plants, um, any peony that would have a characteristic like that, that is one of the things that would be important is that they don't flop um, on there. That's good to know. So I'll, I can save my next spring's peonies from the mower uh, as oh, they yeah. lodge over into the grass. <laughs> yeah. Get yourself some steaks. All right. Awesome. So every year I say I'm going to get the uh, <clears throat> some of those peony cages and put them out and it's been 
five years and I still haven't done it. So <laughs> maybe next year will be the year. <laughs> get them now, Ken. Get them now. Yes. Get prepared. Put them out there now. So yeah, I don't forget. Get them now. Get them now. Um, and so another uh, plant you had in your presentation um, are some lady slippers. I, have, I personally have not grown them, but I've heard they can be kind of tricky, difficult, finicky to grow. Um, have you found that to be the case? Um, yes. And to complicate, you know, whether you're going to take that risk or not, they're relatively expensive. I think probably, you know, the, the cheapest lady slipper, you know, is in that 50 to $70 range for one. Um, and they can get a lot more expensive than that. And so when you combine that they're fussy, um, if you're gonna jump in on lady slippers, make sure you do your research um, and, and understand what their exacting conditions are. And so um, I grow um, several, but my favorite, which you've probably seen a picture of is the Kentucky uh, lady slipper. It's not native to Illinois, but it's it's native uh, in Kentucky. And I would rate it as as being finicky like blueberries are. You need to have the uh, root environment just right. Um, they have specific sun requirements as well. And so, um, you know, when you step away from something like the Kentucky lady slipper, there are other native lady slippers, even to Illinois, that you can get through a reputable dealer. Um, that have very specific pH conditions. And so I steer away from anything like that that requires, you know, like an acid soil or something like that, because that's really kind of tricky uh, to maintain when, when you're spending that much money. So I kind of stick with the ones that are, are pH, you know, normal, uh, what I consider normal. Um, so where I've had success in these is to grow them in a sunken pot. And so other what other words, I have bought um, a two gallon heavy duty liner, um, dug a hole and sunk it snug. And then I have filled it with the media that I've researched that would be good for growing lady slippers. So lady slippers require um, sharply drained soil, but yet moisture uh, in it as well. And so it all excess water must drain off, but still supply enough to um, the roots. And so um, that mixture that I have researched, and this came from um, an orchid grower who helped me with this. And so my mix was six parts pure light, um, two parts potting soil, um, and two parts granite grit. And if I don't have potting soil around, I'll use compost too, you know, fine, fine screen compost or something like that. But anyway, that's kind of the organic um, component uh, to it. Um, I get the granite grit in the chicken section of the farm store. So that's where you would get something like that. If you've ever grown chickens, you know that they have grit as part of their um, dietary needs for um, their, um, what, their giblet, I guess. <laughs> and so I fill the pot um, with that mixture and then the um, plant goes in that and from then on out it is just like a normal garden plant but it's in a hidden pot um, I think the picture that I showed you I pulled away some of the mulch so that you could see the pot it's flush with the ground um, with the artificial um, media on the inside of the pot and so when you're siding uh, orchids people think of them as shade plants and they're not actually shade plants. They require sunlight, but they can't have the heat of the sun. And so some of the best places to cite them is if you're going to um, give them only morning sun and then shade the rest of the day. And that's how I have mine cited. What you're trying to avoid is the hottest part of the sun, which is like noon to four or something like that. So I have it cited. Um, where they get the entire morning. And then when the sun passes by trees that are behind, they are in shade. And so um, every year they increase in size and I'm thinking pretty soon I'm gonna have to get a bigger pot um, and, and move them. So, so far, so good. So long answer to say, yes, they're fussy. <laughs> so another plant that I saw that was new to me was the Indian pink. Uh, it looks like it's nature's rethought version of our native columbine. Is the Indian pink also attractive to hummingbirds like columbine is? And then also, what do you like most about the Indian pink? 
So how'd you know that that's my favorite all time plant in my garden? I think maybe you've been talking to somebody. Um, yes, it, <laughs> Spigelia is my favorite plant. And I don't know, there's just something about, it's like a plant dressed up for Mardi Gras to me. It is just scarlet red on the outside and the tips of the, the petals of the flower are folded back and it's just yellow. I mean, gold yellow. You can't get any more contrast than two primary colors um, on the flower. And they're just stunning. Um, and it is um, an Illinois native, though it's not throughout the state. So it has limited range in Illinois, but it is one of our Illinois native, more common um, to more of our southeastern um, states. But um, I've had this plant uh, for, you know, I started it right off from the very beginning on this property. And it was probably took it 10 years before it actually spread to another site. So, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that I'm always cautious about plants that um, spread too much. I think that there's a direct correlation to how much you like them and how little they spread. It seems like the plants you don't want to spread go all over the place. Um, plants that you just would love to see it in lots of places are really slow to do it. And so I would rate um, spigelia as being um, a little bit fussy to get established. It's not one that you can just plant in the ground and walk away from it. It actually needs to have um, tender, loving care when you first plant it. And so um, it's one that I will, when I'm going to plant another plant, I will usually buy three of them and plant them in three different locations because I never know which one's going to take. Um, it, it, I just have to increase my chance of survival. And these are ones, you know, I would rate uh, heliobores and pulmonaria in the same group that once established, they're really tough. Um, but getting them established, you need to check them every day uh, to make sure that they don't need to be watered or, or something to get them established. But just beautiful. It's one of my favorites. All right. How about another plant here? Uh, Jacob Klein bee balm. How is that different from our what we typically think of as bee balm? Um, well, it's the same screaming red um, as the straight species, except for it's powdery mildew resistant. Um, so it has that same height potential of two to four feet. I find it to be um, to stand on its own fairly well, meaning it doesn't lodge over. I've planted it in front of my husband's basement office so that he's like right level with the bloom. And um, this starts blooming in probably mid-June and it's still in bloom. It will, it will stay in bloom until frost takes it out. And he watches hummingbirds come and go all day long. This is just a, a stunning, stunning plant without uh, the powdery mildew that can occur on the straight, straight species. Does it get any work done? Watching hummingbird dumb. Well, I think it makes um, I think it makes work more enjoyable um, when you look up and see a little hummingbird uh, feeding. I agree. I uh, at my home office on some days of the week, I have some uh, black and blue salvia out my window, oh, and I get to yeah. watch the hummingbirds attack each other over that. So that's fun. yeah. Well, that's just a beautiful plant too. So mm -hmm. it's just. Do you have to plant it every year, or have you got it in a site where it comes back? I treat it as an annual, so yeah. I have it in a container, actually two tall containers flanking the entrance to our deck there. Yeah, it's even as far south as I am, it's not reliably hardy. Um, I've had it some years over winter and I was thrilled to death and other years it was just killed. So it's not reliable. Yeah, well, let, let's talk. OK, some, something about not reliable plants. So they've done a lot of hybridization with purple cone flower, trying to change it to anything but purple. Um, so, but I've always heard people say, well, it usually just reverts over time back to purple. Now I saw in your list, you had white purple cone flower, the high, cold bar name is Fragrant Angel. Why did you pick this one? And I'm curious, is it uh, staying true to its hybridization? Yeah, so this is a Echinacea purpurea, um, so it is one of those selections, but I follow a lot of um, 
plant trials uh, around the country. And one of them um, that I follow is the Mount Cuba Center in Delaware. Mm -hmm. And they just finished their second go round of evaluating cone flowers. The first time they just evaluated them for longevity and you know the quality of the plant. Um, the second time around, they added another characteristic, and that was it's attracting us as a pollinator plant. So how many visits did it get from pollinators? And so I selected this plant um, because um, the Fragrant Angel rated very highly, not only as um, long lived and you know stayed true to form, but it also is highly attractive. Uh, to pollinators. And I've had it for a number of years um, on my property. So I can say that it, it does continue to come back year after year after year um, and is true to form, stays white, and it smells heavenly. Um, but um, I think it's important, you know, for our botanical gardens that are doing research, they're, you know, supplying us with information because coneflowers have been known to be unreliable. Um, and coming out too soon before they were truly, you know, strongly evaluated. And so places like, um, you know, the Chicago Botanic Garden runs a lot of plant trials. Um, Mount Cuba, as I already mentioned, runs. So, I mean, you can, you can do some research on um, the variety trials to, to get some valuable information to help you choose. Same thing with flocks. You know, flocks, some of those can take over the world and flop all over the place and have mildew. Mount Cuba has done a really nice trial on flocks to help you make decisions on that as well. Going back to the, the coneflower you've got, was that the one that was rated higher than even straight species for pollinator attractiveness? Yeah, it was. It, and it, it, it was really kind of surprising. It's one of those examples of, you know, we usually um, have a preference for, for native, but again, um, you know, it's always questionable about whether these are straight species or not, because a lot of breeders, you know, just walk by a, a native stand of plants and there's something unusual, you know, one that has some quality that they really like, and they just propagate that particular quality and slap a name on it. Um, that doesn't mean it's not native. And I think that's where a lot of confusion is on, you know, are these actually a native plant that's just a selection? And they haven't done a good job in the trade of informing um, people, um, you know, buyers, whether this is a hybrid between species or is, or is this just a selection that had superior qualities from a native stand? Yeah, you can go down lots of rabbit holes there. Yeah, you can um, really go down a rabbit hole with that. All right, so moving into a little bit later in the year, um, another one you have listed is um, bottle gentian, and that's a pretty cool, unique looking flower. It's kind of closed up. So how does that get pollinated? You know, I, I wish that I'd had my video camera to, to capture this because I've, I've watched bumblebees muscle their way into turtle head before because that's kind of a closed flower too, not as much as bottle gentian. But I have watched uh, bumblebees, um, the petals of, bottle gentian are, are fused all but right at the tip and bumblebees are can muscle their way in and it's just so cute to watch them do that and and be inside and then watching them get back out um, they kind of get mad a little bit or something you know it's like the flowers got a hold of them um, I'd love to pull up a lawn chair uh, with video equipment and watch that but uh yeah, bottle gentian is one of our beautiful natives. And for anybody that's considering it, um, it's not like all gentians. You have to be very careful about what their site requirements are. This is one that likes uniform moisture and not all gentians do. Some like sharp drainage, the exact opposite. Um, so, but it is one, um, I have mine planted right where my uh, outlet for my gutters on my house is. So anytime it rains, water is flowing over it and it it seems to love it. It gets bigger and bigger every year. You listed saffron crocus as a fall blooming favorite. Do you harvest the saffron from the crocus? You know, <laughs> I don't. Um, but every year when it's in bloom, I actually lay down on the ground and just examine it um, really closely. There's just, I'm not one that's really good about um, picking any flower at all. I just so enjoy them in nature that, um, 
you know, I, do, I don't pick basil unless I, you know, really intend to make something. And unless I had intention at the time to, you know, make rice or, or some dish like that, I, I suppose I could go out and try and, and see if I can do it. So I know the mechanics of it. Um, I know that I need to go out there and, and uh, remove the three little, uh, um, you know, pieces that are on there and dry it for you know, 12 hours without heat. And then I can put it in recipe. So I'm ready to go maybe this year. Um, I'll try it. But no, I haven't actually uh, harvested. I just grow them for their beauty. That's one I'm not I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to look on the hardiness. I think that one might be skirting the edge of reliable hardiness um, in the northern part of the state. I'd have to look to see what the hardiness is. So I, I planted some a couple of weeks ago, so I'll, I can report back next year. Let's see. <laughs> well, I might try that next year too. That sounds like a neat plant. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking. It is. Uh, I didn't write it down what it's hard. For some reason, I'm thinking that that might be a zone six. So, um, but yeah, I'll check that one out. Well, Elizabeth, as we uh, close things out and we get close to the end of the year, there is one plant that you had listed that really caught my attention because I'm looking for something to pair with my goldenrods. I have several different species of goldenrods in my pollinator garden. I was looking at something like New England aster, even like purple dome aster, but Oh, purple domes too manicure looking for this kind of wild and woolly pollinator garden. And I really like what you had now. I might be pronouncing this wrong. Jin Dari, Tatarian Aster. Yeah, it's a Tatarian Aster. And, mm -hmm. you know, I have, I have the Asters that you've mentioned and they just have a completely different structure to them. So the Tatarian mm -hmm. Aster is a more upright, stiff Aster. Um, pretty resistant to any form of lodging. I, I don't even think it thinks about falling over. It is definitely upright. Um, and it has a very unique um, color that is difficult to capture on film. It is a light powder blue purple color, just beautiful. And this is a plant that I have actually pulled lawn chairs up um, beside it just to watch the pollinators come and go. And so not only pollinators, but you see a lot of the predator insects there too laying in wait. So you know that they have already figured out that this is a place to be, um, you know, in early fall if, if you want to eat. And so it is a really busy place. Um, in the morning, uh, just this morning when I walked out there, um, mine is getting ready to come into bloom right now. And you will see some of the solitary bees just resting. Uh, on the plant, um, it's where they go, you know, and they rest overnight. And I, you can almost pet them a little bit, you know, because they're, you know, a little bit cold and not awake yet. But it's it's a busy plant um, for um, pollinators, but it also uh, has nice structure. It probably look pretty well. In fact, my uh, goldenrod is fairly close to it too, so it's a good color combination and and structurally similar. Well, Elizabeth, that was a lot of great information. I love your philosophy of plant it. Hey, things are going to eat it. Uh, you'll manage it as best you can, but you want to see that 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 dynamic um, uh, world that we live in in your backyard. So that's so cool. I'm so happy to that that we were talk today. Yes. Well, the Good Growing Podcast is produced by Wendy Ferguson and edited by me. Chris Enroth. Oh, wait, no, this week it's edited by Ken, Ken Johnson. Uh, special thanks goes to Katie and Ken for being with us this week. Thanks, Katie and Ken. And thanks, Ken, for the edits. Thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing all your information. And Ken and Chris, it's always a pleasure to see you. I definitely enjoyed my time with you guys. Yes, thank you, Elizabeth. I got some more things to try out now. My wife may not be happy about this one, but... <laughs> She'll get over it. Some more Christmas <laughs> gifts, right? <laughs> and yes, if you have any editing complaints, you can send those to me, everybody. I tell you, once you start, you can't stop. It's like potato chips. <laughs> oh, I know. All righty. And Chris and Katie, thank you as always. Want to do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. We're going to be talking with local foods educator Nick Frillman all about growing garlic. Tis the season for planting garlic. So, folks, listeners, Thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening, or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing.